Hi, welcome to our Nine North Compass program. Nine North is jumping into the community conversation on timely subject matter that has been magnified because of the pandemic. Throughout 2021, we'll be hosting a series of um, listening sessions about controversial topics that impact our community. Today, we examine the topic of homelessness. In the news, we see many stories about homeless encampments in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but those are just part of the story. Homelessness actually refers to a condition wherein, wherein people lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence as defined by the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. We have joined with two experts in the field to learn how this impacts our local community, what local organizations are doing, and how you can help. My name is Kathy Ramont, co-founder of Do Good Roseville, a group that makes connections to share ideas and information in order to do things that have a positive impact on our community. Today's program is a perfect example of ways we can learn more about our neighbors and resources in the community. We will see how homelessness has been impacted by the pandemic. First, let's welcome Michelle decker Gerard. Michelle is a senior research manager and director of the Homeless Study for Wilder Research. Wilder Research leads the Minnesota Homeless Study, which provides the most comp comprehensive data and analysis of the reasons Minnesotans are homeless and barriers to obtaining and maintaining self, um, safe and stable housing. The statewide study is conducted every three years and provides data analysis and reporting that helps improve understanding about the prevalence, causes, circumstances, and effects of homeless, homelessness in Minnesota and guides actions to eliminate homelessness. Our second speaker is going to be Michael Stanefsky. Michael comes to us from the Roseville School District, where he is the lead social worker and helps coordinate the McKinney-Vento services for students. The McKinney-Vento Act is designed to address the challenges that homeless children and youths face in enrolling, attending, and succeeding in school. We had planned to have a third panelist, um, Lonnie Adalin from um, who was the minister, who was the continuum of care coordinator for heading home Ramsey. Um, but we ha unfortunately had a last minute conflict, unavoidable conflict. So Lonnie won't be joining us, but we did want to let you know about the coalition that she's part of. Um, heading home Ramsey is a community wide partnership committed to the goal of ending homelessness in cities and neighborhoods of Ramsey County. Heading Home Ramsey is a coalition of social service providers, housing providers, philanthropic partners, business, community, government, and citizens working together to create and implement cost-effective solutions. Unfortunately, since Lani is not gonna be able to be here, um, we will not have her input on this panel, but we strongly recommend that you go to the Heading Home Ramsey website, um, their, that page, and you'll get more information about all that they do. Um, so thank you for both Michelle and Michael for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, um, we have a series of questions that we're gonna ask in, a, in an alternating order. When you're ready, we'll start, um, we'll start with Michelle from Wilder Research. Um, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about your work at Wilder Research and your perspective on the problem of homelessness? Sure, thanks, Kathy, for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I am a senior research manager at Wilder Research in St. Paul, and I'm also the director of the Minnesota Homeless Study. And what the study is, is every three years since 1991, uh, Wilder has coordinated um, providers as well as volunteers to go out on a single night in October and conduct interviews with people experiencing homelessness. So we have folks, we coordinate with folks all across the state, including groups like Lonnie's, to go to every emergency shelter, domestic violence shelter, transitional housing facility, and then we work with outreach folks to talk to people who are not staying in shelters. Um, and so the last time we did the study was back in 2018, and we're doing it again this year in October. Uh, and, and basically what we've you know, learned from the study over the years is this incredible trend line. When we first started doing the homeless um, study back in 1991, uh, we counted about a little over 3,000 people experiencing homelessness in our state. And the last time we did the study back in October of 2018, it was over 11,000 people experiencing homelessness. And there are more children experiencing homelessness now than the entire homeless population when we first started doing the count. So, um, and I'm sure Michael can talk more about that. Um, but we have these trend lines and we know a lot about the characteristics of people experiencing homelessness through the study work. 
Okay, great. Um, it's a great study. I've participated in that as a volunteer a couple of times, and I, it was really eye-opening for me. So um, thank you for that. Um, Michael, it's your turn. How about, can you tell us about your work with the Roseville School District and then your perspectives on, the perspective you bring on this problem? Sure. Um, again, thank you, uh, Kathy, for in inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, my name is Michael. I work as a, a school social worker in the Roseville School District. Um, in addition to my duties as a school social worker, I also um, serve as a McKinney-Vento liaison, which means that I support students and families who are experiencing homelessness um, or in, uh, in unstable housing um, and ensuring that they have access to, um, to education, that despite uh, their living situation, that that education isn't disrupted. And then that we also work to, um, to connect them to community agencies and services and, and uh, assist in, the, in, the, in supporting them in, in um, re-engaging with housing. Um, the other part of that McKinney-Vento uh, role is also educating staff and the community. Um, there are, uh, you know, Michelle can probably talk about this a lot, but there are, you know, there are, uh, there are some signs that are obvious um, when, when looking for homeless uh, students and families, but there are others that aren't. And, and so um, it does, it does, um, it's important to pay attention to, uh, to some of the, the signs and, and things that, that people say or that you notice that might help you lead, lead you to believe that maybe there is a situation where there's a student or family experiencing homelessness. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so for our second question, and this was, a really big one, <laughs> so we can take some time on this one, um, was to, based on the work um, that you're doing, um, so we'll start with Michael this time. Well, I'm not being confused. We'll start with Michelle, but go back to Michelle this time. Um, Michelle, can you, based on your years of experience with Wilder, um, the homeless study, what else can you tell us about the causes and the impacts of homelessness? So, I mean, that is a really big question, but if you can give us some highlights of that. Yeah, that is that is a great question. <laughs> and there are a lot of um, issues that go into a uh, homeless situation. And, you know, one of the things that I think about is we're all, you know, one paycheck or one layoff away. You know, it's if, if you're vulnerable and you're on the edge, then you can experience homelessness. Um, and basically, usually for a lot of people, it's, it's the accumulation of, of a couple of different crises. It's not usually just one thing. Um, and so the number one issue, of course, is housing affordability. Um, in our state, um, you know, affordable housing is, uh, and there's not enough of it um, for our population um, who are living at the, the margins. Um, when you look at our rental housing market in particular, um, the vacancy rate in the Twin Cities ho hovers between one and 3% for all um, folks. And so you have people experiencing homelessness or might have some issue in their background, like maybe a criminal background from 20 years ago or whatever, they're competing for housing with everybody else. And housing affordability is a huge issue. So the average um, income for people experiencing homelessness is around $550 a month. And the average rents are hovering around nine, 950 a month. Um, and so the math just doesn't add up. And then if you add on to that other situations that people experience, such as health crises or mental health crises, it kind of layers on, <coughs> excuse me, I got something in my throat, layers on the issue. Um, the other thing that we notice is that many people experiencing hom homelessness have had um, significant traumatic experiences in their life. So about a third of our homeless women have experienced domestic violence. And so that is also um, a leading cause for homelessness for that population. Um, a lot of our homeless population also might have experienced trauma as a child, such as abuse by a family member or uh, chemical dependency in the household, mental health problems in the household, maybe a family member who had been incarcerated and taken out of the home and therefore that income was gone and that relationship building was gone and that type of thing. Um, and then there's just sort of um, immediate situations that might result in homelessness like eviction, uh, foreclosure and that type of thing. Um, and so our study tends to pick up more of those folks who are experiencing long-term homelessness rather than the short episodes of homelessness. So, you know, there's a lot of us who know people that have maybe had to stay on somebody's couch for a couple of nights in between um, places to live because they just lost their housing. 
um, particularly with our younger population, some of the folks that Michael might work with. Um, but um, sort of that crisis on top of crisis will lead to the longer term homeless situation. And then it's very difficult to secure housing again because of that rent gap. Um, and we can talk a little bit also about the subsidies that some families need, um, the rental subsidies. So there's usually not enough rent vouchers to help people pay rent for the population that could qualify for them. So there, for our homeless population, about half the population is on a waiting list for rental assistance for a, a Section 8 voucher. And another 15% can't even get on the waiting list because they're closed. They're already full. So um, there is this huge gap for, for the population. Uh, and so, and does it, it does a little bit of getting into wages, you know, so affordable housing and also wage related, right? And what, uh, what's a living wage for people, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I can say that over the course of time of doing this study, what we see is that when the economy is doing well, a lot more folks in our homeless population are actually employed. Um, and But the issue is, is that they can't always get the full-time employment. Um, and so they might be cobbling together a couple of different jobs um, and it's not enough to pay for um, all the expenses that they have. Um, and so I think it is a misperception that most homeless people are, you know, not working. A lot of folks are working, um, but they aren't making enough to, to make ends meet like that. If you're living in a shelter situation, sometimes it is very difficult to work um, and to get out. You know, you might not have a home address to give an employer. Uh, you know, you might not have a phone, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of barriers um, to be able to get employment. And so, um, a lot of the efforts of workers is to help connect people to employment um, and help them get there and and do what they need so that so that they can get out of that situation and gain some self self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, people want their own place to to be and live. They want their own home. Right. Oh wow! And so I mean, it's just so there's just so many layers to it and so many impacts of that. Wow, um, Michael, what can you tell us about that you're seeing from the standpoint of the schools? Um, <laughs> kind of causes of that. And then we'll talk about impacts later. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I wanted to add to the discussion around um, employment and the lack of employment, especially specifically related to the pandemic is the, I, I think the impact on those, you know, those, uh, you, uh, Michelle had talked about um, people having low, low wage jobs and maybe not always making enough. And, and many of those low wage jobs were impacted by the pandemic. And so where you maybe had just barely enough to, to keep your head kind of at the top of, above water now, so many families are having a hard time even doing that. Um, and layering on the complications and the challenges of, of distance learning um, and the lack of childcare, it can just make all of those things a, a lot more challenging. Um, I, uh, as, as far as um, other, other, uh, causes or, or signs, implications. I think one of the things that it, my, when I first started as a social worker, I was working, we talked a little bit before here, I, I worked at a, a youth serving agency in Minneapolis and we work with homeless student, homeless youth a lot. And, and um, I know uh, there's a lot of focus around um, the encampments that we see in Minneapolis and in St. Paul in the center cities. And, and, and we think we, we can easily think that um, that means that there isn't homelessness in the in the um, in the suburbs. But you know, you rent, you mentioned the McKinney Vento uh, Act earlier, and uh, the definition of, of of housing is you know fixed, regular, and adequate. But we think about um, when when we look at families in the schools who who qualify for those services, uh, we think about you know those families who are who are sharing you know doubled up or couch hopping or in an emergency shelter or in a transitional shelter or even youth who you know unaccompanied youth who've been abandoned by their parents or abandoned in in hospitals or um you know those kind of things uh, living in their car we had a family many years ago several years ago who um lived in a tent for several months and brought their you know their kids to school you know but then we went back to the tent in, in a park and, and lived there um and so I, I think it's it's important, especially when we think about the the you know the greater suburb area. It's important to think that homelessness looks different than what we think uh, when we when we think when we drive through St. Paul or Minneapolis and we see um, you know the the gatherings of of tents and things. That it can look different and it can be harder to harder to find and harder to notice um, in um, in uh, in the suburbs. And, and and I think some of the impacts that we see it as far as um, 
on students. I mean, obviously, if, if you don't have a place to sleep at night or if you you're, you have ina ina inadequate place to sleep, that can really impact your ability to um, a be healthy, but also to to do things like homework. Uh, to participate if, if there's ever an illness or anything like that. Um, it, attendance can be a problem. Uh, and so there are a, a number of those things that, that schools pay attention to anyway that can become exacerbated um, when a family is, is in a situation where they're um, homeless or, or in unstable housing. And then adding that on top of what Michelle was saying, like the trauma as a child leads right. to homelessness and as adults. So it sounds like if, if we're having that trauma as children, it's just leading, it's setting them up for failure in the future yeah. or for problems in the future. And and, and so often uh, families don't just experience one, have one experience of, of, of homelessness. Oftentimes um, it can be a cyclical thing and it can be something that, um, you know, a, a hole that's, that's hard to get out of. And as we think, as we, as we think about in the future, you know, I, I realize, and, and uh, you know, you, Michelle can talk more about the, um, the moratorium on, on, um, uh, evictions and things like that. But as we think about when that might end and the impact that that will have on people who have been struggling just to maintain their housing now, you know, there's there's a, a very real fear that we will have an, uh, an, a huge increase in, in homeless uh, adults and homeless families as, as a result of those evictions when this pandemic is over. Oh, wow. Well, that's, I'm wondering like, if Lonnie could be here to talk about kind of what, how we're maybe the city or the county are preparing for that. You know, I'm assuming we know that this is coming. So, um, so hopefully, well, I think one that's, thing that's something that, to follow, I think, as far as what's yeah, going on. One of the things that I participated in, and actually, I think I've even been, uh, met Lonnie a couple times. Um, there, there's a, a coalition of, of service agencies, Merrick Community Services, and Keystones, and Clues, and St. Saint, uh, Saint Andrews, and then um, county folks, and, and people like that, and then representatives from the school districts. And we would gather once a month to talk about what are the services, what are the needs, how can we help each other. And when the pa pandemic hit, we started meeting every week, uh, A, because we needed to, but also because just like the uh, the, the needs were, were that much greater. Um, and so... Uh, Though I think that's one of the responses that we're that we're trying, one of the ways that we're trying to to stay um, on top of the situation and stay ahead of of um, of the, the the concern, but also to be able to share information. That's actually been one of the most useful uh, aspects for my role is to be able to meet every week with folks from uh, from the county, uh, folks from a service, social service agencies like St. Andrews and Clues and Merrick and Cum uh, Keystone and, and many others. Um, that we work with on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah, and well, I, guess, I guess I'll just ahead. add that, um, you know, during the pandemic, that's one of the sort of unintended consequences of the pandemic, I think, too, is just all the innovative ways that um, different um, communities are working to protect this population and try to. Um, to respond to this huge issue. I mean, it's happening all over the country, right? And so um, I think it is one of those sort of watershed moments where we realize what a safety a home is. Um, can you imagine being sick and being a, in a place where you are in a congregate place with a lot of other people? Um, that's a lot of people don't want to go to shelter right now, right? Because it doesn't right. feel safe. And so one of the first things, and I think Minnesota did a really excellent job on this, really quickly tried to um, depopulate the shelters and, and try to add some safety um, there. So 50% capacity rather than 100% capacity. And people may wonder, well, what do they do with all those people? And one of the things they did was they used the CARES Act money and then Minnesota um, ponied up as well, our state did. Um, through emergency services grants to um, house people in um, hotels and motels, particularly the most vulnerable populations, so people who had chronic health issues. So we know that um, from our data that over half of the homeless population has a chronic physical health condition that interferes you know, with their daily activities and that type of thing. And that could be asthma or cancer or chronic pain or you know, a multitude of other conditions. And so um, those folks um, did get into hotels um, because of the hard work of people like Michael. And um, in the suburbs, you know, I think traditionally 
you don't see people in the suburbs because there aren't shelters in the suburbs, right? You know, except for the, now the partnership with St. Andrews. And so people are going into the city um, if they become homeless in the study. In our, in our study, about 16% of the population that we interview statewide were last housed in the suburbs, but that's not necessarily where we interview them because that's not where they can find a place to, to stay when they're homeless. And so I do think that's a misperception that that doesn't happen in the suburbs. Um, and um, so, so there have been all these innovative things and I think it's made policymakers think, well, if we could solve this problem so quickly during the beginning of the, con well, they didn't solve it, but like address it so quickly <laughs> and so innovatively during the beginning of the pandemic, what can we do to continue some of these things and this huge public will to try to house these people so that they're safe. Um, and, you know, if, if you have housing, then you can work on your other issues that you might be experiencing your physical health problems, or if you have mental health problems, you can stay on your meds. If you have a place, your, your own home, um, you can work on nutrition, you can work on getting, um, education services for your kids. Everything improves if you have that stability. Mm -hmm. So I, I am worried about what will happen when the, um, the rental, um, the moratorium lifts on eviction, but I also have some hope that maybe there's enough public will to really push forward some policies to be able to stabilize families so that they they can maintain housing um, and have those resources available to them. Well, and that's really important to let, so that people, the community knows that that is important and that we do need to be, keep these things going and let our let people let our elected officials know that that matters to us. So if we um, went back to Michelle a little bit more on um, what are some of the things that need to be done to address like overall on homelessness. And we talked a little bit about affordable housing. Um, is that, and, and wages, are there some other things that we need that need to be done to address the homeless problem? I mean, that's yeah. Question. Yeah. I mean, of course it's a complex mm -hmm. issue and everybody's story is different and there's no, you know, homeless people are not alike and everyone has a different pathway into homelessness and out of homelessness. But I think uh, one of the things that we always want to talk about is prevention. So um, if we can prevent homelessness, it breaks the cycle. So when we do our study, about a quarter of our population of adults experiencing homelessness first experience homelessness as a child. Mm -hmm. And so we do see that this can become a cyclical issue of poverty and homelessness and really want to break that cycle. And a lot of that starts with um, services to families who might be on the edge. Um, so if they um, are experiencing some crisis, we need more services to help them get through that and stabilize and have the um, help they need to be able to get through those experiences um, to kind of go upstream, as we can say, to stop um, the cycle of homelessness. And then once people um, fall into homelessness through you know whatever situation that makes that happen, we really want that homeless episode to be as brief as possible. The longer it goes, the harder things are um, in terms of the family and the impact on the family. Um, and so I think um, that's really a big effort right now with um, our state office and homelessness. They talk a lot about having homelessness become rare and brief um, and non-reoccurring. Um, and so that is kind of the goal that we can probably never get to a place where people don't hit a crisis that might end up losing housing. But if we can have that loss be super rare and super brief and so that they get right back into housing again, that will, uh, for our whole population, start to address this issue. And so one of the things we try to do is something called rapid rehousing and giving people sort of that rental assistance pretty quickly to get back into housing. And I think oh, one of the things that people like Michael do, the, the McKinney Vento coordinators. So it was, the act was named after Bruce Vento, who's from Minnesota, who was a congressman here. And it was like this seminal um, piece of legislation that allows if a, if a child becomes homeless, they can still go to the school that they were originally at. And the school district has to make all efforts to try to get them back to that school so they don't have as much disruption. And so I think um, that is really something that helps stabilize, again, the child and the family. Okay. Um, so that's something else to think about when we're thinking about addressing this issue. Um, yeah, in, in addition to the um, 
uh, the being able to remain at the school of origin. So if I have a family who contacts me today and, and says, we just lost our house, we're moving to a shelter, <clears throat> they, they, can re- they can remain uh, at the school of origin r- for as long as they're experiencing homelessness. Um, and that can carry over from year to year if, if, that's, if that is the situation. Um, but the, a few of the other things that, that the legislation requires is that we provide transportation to and from school, uh, actually to and from school events. So not, not, only, not only school, but also extracurricular activities and things like that. Um, so if a, if, a student, if a student is enrolled at a school in Falcon Heights, for example, but it ends up in a shelter in, um, in Minneapolis or in Dakota County somewhere, um, we provide transportation back and forth um, for, to that school so that, we're, so that we don't disrupt their learning. Because one of the things we know as educators is that a di- you know, mobility can be, uh, have a significant impact on academic success and graduation rates and those sorts of things. So we wanna make sure that students are able to stay in the school, um, in the school that they're enrolled. They also, um, I mean, this might go without saying, but they're also automatically qualified for free and reduced lunch services. Um, they also automatically uh, um, qualify for um, Title I services, which would be um, additional academic supports. So we think about like after school tutoring or um, uh, you know, Minnesota Reading Corps or Math Corps, those kinds of programs that we they, they would automatically qualify for those services as well. Um, but a few other things that I think are important to notice or to think about when we think about what would what would make an impact, what would make a difference. I mean, we we just need we need to in, uh, enact a minimum livable wage. Like we just can't not we can't pretend that's not a thing. Um, I also think that you know I'm going back to something that Michelle said at the very beginning, uh, and maybe this was even before, um, where she talked about the number of youth homeless youth in the most recent study was greater than the number of homeless people in the original study. And what that says to me as an educator is that that means those aren't all unaccompanied youth. So those are a lot of families. And in order for those families to get back on their feet, in order for those adults and parents to be working, they need childcare. And so, I mean, we, we, you know, we don't, we don't automatically think of living wage and childcare and education as, as um, responses or, or the answer or the way to, to solve homelessness, but they certainly are a piece of the puzzle and ones that we just can't ignore. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to tie those all, all those things back to get all together. So um, it's it's interesting to hear all the all the programs are that kids have to be kept in their same school. And so the money we spend on transportation, if we could use that to find them housing or affordable housing, might also have an impact as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what we um, wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, I don't know if you have any suggestions or what, if I know somebody that I think is homeless or is newly homeless, are there any suggestions about what they could do? I don't know, we'll start with Michelle, if you know from the homeless study or what the programs you know about, you know, what would I do if I thought I was gonna be homeless next week or something or tonight? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I actually, I'm just a researcher, but I actually have people call me occasionally with that question um, in real life situations. And, um, you know, I think it depends on people where people are at in terms of their situation. So there are some people that just needs a short term stabilization. And usually um, my advice is, do you have a safe family or friend that you can stay with um, during that time where you need to be stabilized? And then depending on the situation, um, in terms of if it's a longer term situation or crisis situation, there are, um, there's a, a Ramsey County homeless intake line uh, for housing assistance um, and uh, that can help um, you know, get people on the list or help them find a place to stay. Um, there's 211, first call for help, um, that can also help connect people to services they need. So usually, you know, I, I think the question is, is can they rely on their informal support system? Is that system reliable and safe? Um, because if it is, that's probably the preferred thing that we try to do. So in your neighborhood, if you know of a family that's struggling, I think the first thing is to like, you know, re- reach out and help. And sometimes people just need somebody to talk to. Sometimes they might need somebody to watch their kids, as Michael was talking about in terms of childcare, a little respite um, from taking care of kids and the stress of life um, and that type of thing. I think this is really hard during the pandemic. Um, and so that, that adds an extra layer on top of everything. Um, but when the situation is safe, we can just help um, 
provide some support to families who might be struggling, I think that's pretty critical. For the homeless youth population, it's kind of the same thing for unaccompanied youth who are without their parents. I think that a lot of times those youth are couch hoppers. They kind of cobble together places to stay night to night. Um, and if those places are safe and stable and good for the youth, then I think that's one situation. If it's not, if it's a dangerous situation for the youth, then there are resources available um, through, again, you can look through the county service agencies or some of our drop-in centers. Um, there's one in Minneapolis and one in St. Paul, and the one in St. Paul is called Safe Zone, um, and it can help connect uh, youth to uh, appropriate services. Um, and then if you're in a school, then I think it's people like your McKinney Vento coordinator, mm -hmm. like Michael. So, um, you know, there's there's a variety of options available. It is it can be really hard um, to find immediate shelter if it's like the middle of the day and you need something for a family. Um, and, and there are people that work on that. But um, but it is it can be a real big crisis situation if there aren't places to go. Okay. Well, and then, Michael, we're talking about since you're actually right here in the Roseville area, um, any ideas of what people would do if I, if there was a family I knew was in trouble? Well, I think, I think Michelle's suggestion of two on one is a, is a great, uh, a great first place to start. Um, it can be hard to try to remember all of the various agencies and who serves which community yes. and, and all of that sort of stuff. And so uh, that's one of the, I think that's one of the advantages of something like two on one. It, it's sort of a clearinghouse for a whole host of, um, social and, and mental health and, and uh, all kinds of different needs. Um, <clears throat> so that, I mean, that would be a great recommendation. I also, I mean, I, I, I you, you, the, the, the example you gave at the very beginning, Michelle, about a family, um, maybe, you know, see if you, if there are family or friends that you could stay with from, from a McKinney Vento perspective, we would still consider that family to be homeless, even if they're doubled up with a family member or with a friend. And so we would then, we would, we would want to know that because then we can help get them connected, not only to the McKinney Vento services that they have a right to at school, but also, um, help connect them to community agencies. So I, I feel like reaching out to your school, either a, a child's teacher, um, a school social worker, even just calling the office. I mean, one of the things that, that we often tell people is, you know, you could call me, Kathy, you could call me about a family tomorrow. I might not be able to tell you any, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything, but I, cer I certainly could listen and, 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 and act on that information um, and try to do some, some learning on, you know, and trying to investigate and figuring things out uh, on our end to see what we can do to support families. So, I mean, again, we might not think of schools as a, a first a, a place to, to look in when supporting homeless uh, youth and families, but it, we certainly, you know, schools are, 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 are becoming more and more uh, social service agencies in addition to academic instruction agencies and in addition to educational institutions. And so um, that is a, certainly a great place for, for families or, or for anybody who has interest. It would also be uh, worth mentioning that, uh, you know, in the Roseville area anyway, many, many, many churches um, have uh, outreach, um, have social justice programs. Many of the churches offer community meals. And so that's another place for folks to think about is to look even within your own faith community um, to see whether there might be a group that, that is working to support um, families. And, and many, in my experience, many of those churches and faith communities will serve and support um, uh, people regardless of whether they're uh, members of that particular community or not. Okay. So knowing the schools and the churches and what's happening in our community is important um, yeah. are good places to start. And I wasn't, I've only recently heard about 211. So that's a, that's also a good resource to, for people to be aware of. I believe, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was originally uh, like run or maybe still is run by the United Way. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Great. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, we're getting towards the end here. Um, and I was just wondering if each of you have like a final thought or some final takeaway that you would want people to be aware of um, when they're thinking about homelessness. Like something, maybe, is there something about it that surprises you that you think would surprise people as well? Well, I can go. I um, So as part of our study, as Kathy mentioned, we use volunteers to conduct these face-to-face -face interviews. They're 30 to 45 minute interviews with people experiencing homelessness. And I've been doing them for a long time. And as yes, study director, I do a lot of them. So I, I, last time I did the study, I started out in a family shelter. And then I went to a hot meal program at a church um, to interview folks. And then I went to a large shelter in downtown St. Paul for single people. 
And then I ended up the night at the, uh, the end of a light rail at a re- light rail station interviewing people who were sleeping on the train. So the whole day was a lot of different experiences, but every single time I do the experience, I end up in my car crying because there is always somebody that I interview that is similar to me or somebody in my family or somebody I love. And so it really makes me realize that these stories are, you know, all individual people that could be me or somebody I love. And it gives me such compassion to know that, you know, they want to talk to us for our study. They're taking the time and the effort to share their stories to try to solve this problem. So everybody's an individual. Everybody is in my um, experience there, but for the grace of God, go I type of situation. And so the last time I did the study, I did interview a gentleman that was so much like my father, (laughs) even with his humor, um, sitting in, you know, sitting in the middle of a large shelter, um, and he had an oxygen, this gentleman had an oxygen machine that he had to carry with him. Um, and, um, he was funny and he was sweet and, um, he had recently left a nursing home facility without a permanent place to stay, um, and had ended up in an emergency shelter situation eventually. So, um, that's, I guess that's just what I want to share is that it's, it's not, such a foreign situation that these stories are so different than our own. I know when I did the, the woman that one of the women I interviewed was my age and was so surprised she was homeless, had never expected that it would be her. So I, I share that. So I'll let you take just a minute to plug the, the homeless study that's coming up though, this October. Yes. For yes. people to volunteer for that. Yeah. So we'll be, we'll be um, working on um, coordinating volunteers starting in the summer we have to kind of sort of manage it in the midst of COVID. So we don't know what kind of restrictions we'll have for our volunteers and that type of thing. But usually we recruit about 1100 volunteers for the study. So it's an opportunity that will be available on our website, mnhomeless.org. Great. Thank you. And Michael, do you want to give us a final thought or final word? Uh, I I guess I would just, uh, I would say that um, it's important to remember that uh, just because we don't see people who are homeless in our community doesn't mean there aren't homeless people in our community. Um, it can be easy to to think of homelessness as the encampments that we see when we drive through the the larger um, center cities or the 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 individuals that we see at the on the uh, the exit ramps and the and the entrance ramps and things. Um, um, but there are. There are children and there are families in our schools and in our communities and on our, our uh, sports teams and, and everywhere else. Um, and those families want the same things for their children that we want for our children. Um, and it's important. And I, and Michelle will probably also add this, that uh, just as we, as we are you know, really understanding that homelessness exists, although it's not as easily uh, visible in the suburbs, it also exists in um rural Minnesota as well, rural areas also. Um, So it's important to remember that homelessness isn't just a big city problem. Great. Well, thank you. That's a perfect a perfect way to end this. Thank you. Um, and so for the, everyone that's watching, uh, we want to thank you for joining us today on Compass. Um, I really appreciate um, Michelle and Michael taking the time to be part of this and share your insights. Um, we hope that this overall gives everyone who's watching some insights as to what is happening right here in our community and some ideas and things you can do to help your neighbors. Um, for more content like this, check out our new website, www.ninenorth.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.